everybody welcome back to the cabin I'm finally answering a question that a lot of you have had from the beginning and that's what does this co place cost what did it cost me to build and I guess what did it cost me to completely set up this lifestyle so I'll try to answer both of those questions um, there's a lot of variables a lot of things that can be changed could be changed by somebody else doing this and that uh, maybe I would have done differently or could do differently or if I was to rebuild what would I would I add more things if would I spend more money or would I change the materials and stuff um, so I'm gonna answer all those questions as, as concisely as I can going at this a little bit differently what I did is walked around the cabin and looked at every single thing that I did here every item and then itemized that in this long list put the quantities beside it because like I said if I just bought like say 50 two by sixes and, and then use them for random projects around here which I've done then it was not as accurate as actually just walking around the cabin yesterday and counting all the things that I actually use so this list is exactly that I've walked around I've itemized everything I put down the unit price multiplied of course the quantity that I actually used by the unit price came out with a total of what I spent or in some cases what I would have spent if I had have purchased that wood and also I'm going to show you what I could have eliminated or what I did eliminate in some cases because I got it for free but that you could eliminate too if you could find it from somewhere else so I guess I'll start with the bottom line what would it cost for somebody to exactly duplicate what I've done on the cabin up to this date so I'm not including any extra stuff I'm going to add after this so the total figure is $5,637. So I think it would be fair to round that up a little bit uh, in case there's anything I did miss. And also maybe taxes and stuff like that. So $5,637. So I'll round that up to say $6,000. So if I spent, or somebody spent $6,000 to recreate this pretty simple in our area, to make six thousand dollars there's lots of jobs available there's a shortage of tradesmen skilled tradesmen and laborers in the area in most of Ontario so the average wage therefore starting wage like entry-level job is around fifteen dollars I think the minimum wage is thirteen or something for even a student like basic entry-level retail job so it sh you should easily be able to make make uh, twenty dollars an hour here if you're a you're resourceful or you have some skills or, or if you're a hard worker so the average work year is two thousand hours so if you're able to make forty thousand dollars just imagine if you had a house that was six thousand dollars now of course that's not included in the land land is so variable it's hard to factor that in I can tell you what I paid for this and then I can tell you what else was on the market when we bought this so this is 20 acres in an unorganized township which allows me to do this because you can't get building permits in this area and therefore there's no inspectors there's no where you could apply for a permit other than sewage and road but I don't need those things so I didn't need any permits so for me I was able to pick up this land my wife actually found it 20 acres in an unorganized township backing on to literally I don't know, look at a map it's like a hundred miles to the next development west of here um, there is some development half an hour 40 minutes east of here but in this area there's nothing so I have access to all of this public crown land we call it here in Canada all this crown land that I can use um, for hunting and exploring and fishing and all that kind of stuff so it's basically like I have thousands of acres at my disposal but it's 20 acre parcel that we actually own we paid fifty thousand dollars for it exactly on the market at the same time the next uh, property that we were seriously considering considered was five and a half acres and that um, was actually south of here but on a really remote road as well very little traffic um, there but also difficult to get to in the winter because the road was would be the last road that would be plowed in that area that this one is too but it's kept in pretty good shape actually uh, 
but anyway, that property was 22000 I think it ended up selling for. And that was also surrounded, there's no other development there, surrounded by Crown Land as well. So you could have access to all of that, but also have the privacy. So $50,000, you could pay as little as, say, $22,000. If you went further north, you could pay less. Um, the challenge, of course, with the smaller acre, acreages is, is that you might not be able to get enough building materials for the property. So there's a lot of things we were looking for in a property that were really non-negotiable. One was the unorganized township. One was access to water. So uh, water was primary. So we have the stream, we have uh, snow, we have the dug well, and then we have another pond up at the south end of the property at the highest elevation here. So lots of water. Uh, we wanted access to lots of crown land, we wanted privacy and qu uh, quiet and materials, building materials, so land that had a lot of trees on it, which this one's fully treed. It was logged last about 15 years ago, so it's not old growth, but there's a lot of firewood and a lot of wildlife habitat. Alright, so the things that I spent money on, or actually start with the things that I didn't actually purchase. So for the total of $5,637 that we're rounding up to 6000 The logs I cut down, all the trees, enough to do at least two cabins from my two friends' place, so places, property. So I have a whole bunch of cedar, or cut a whole bunch of cedar, spruce, red pine, and white pine. These, um, a lot of these logs for this cabin and for the sawn actually are 12 foot cedar fence posts, which is why the, uh, a lot of them were debarked. I did have to debark a lot of them myself, but a lot of them were debarked and then uh, I picked them up in a trailer. So, and then I cut down a well, balsam fir, some posts are balsam fir, a lot of the trim work is balsam fir that I cut down here on this property, just right around here, and some cedars as well. So the logs I didn't end up paying for for this cabin, in other words. So that, that uh, these fence posts though, if you were to buy them, and I did buy a few for the sauna, they're $24 each and I used 80, 80 to build this cabin with. I spent uh, two, uh, what did I spend? $586 for 244 2 by 6 by 10 foot, which is what I did the roof for with. A lot of those I had sawn, like I had taken to a, a mill to get sawn from the red pine that I cut down, and others I purchased from a rough mill that actually has really cheap lumber. I mentioned that a couple of times at the time when I was building how cheap it was. It was actually ended up making more sense for me to do that than try to hand make them. It would have taken me forever because I wasn't using any power equipment at the time. So 244 of those, which sounds like a lot, but the roof is a double layer of 2 by 6 by 10 and it's a full 10 foot run on either side. So 244 of them, which is what, 44 times 88, 176, just to do the roof. And then of course the floor is done with them as well, and the floor of the loft. So $586 for those. I used 80 1 by 10 by 10 feet, and that was for the roof that I charred. I ended up charring those boards and made a board and batten roof and that was $176 plus that includes also some that I use for the interior as well. Um, got steel spikes I, I could have got rid of those if I had used a wood doweling which I intended to do. I did some wood dowels but I found that I just wasn't um, able to do it the holes, bore the holes fast enough. I didn't have the right tools at the time. I do have an auger now that I'm using on the sauna that I wish I had back then. I would have eliminated the spikes. That was almost $200 worth of nails and spikes that I could have got taken out of the, the equation. Uh, the roof membrane, it's almost impossible to build a watertight roof without it. Even old trappers cabins, other than the real old ones, use some kind of roofing membrane underneath even the sod or uh, whatever else they roofed with it, whether it was metal, shingles, uh, cedar shakes like I did on the kitchen. You need some kind of roof membrane, even if it's just tar paper underneath so that was hundred and twenty dollars what you would replace that with traditionally is is uh, birch bark but it's not very many big huge mature birch bark trees around anymore that you can get flat sheets off of that are um, 
thick enough and high quality enough to be considered a roof membrane. But if you did, you would overlap them just like shingles all the way up the roof. I used 20 bags of cement for the floor underneath the stove, the backsplash of, of rocks behind the stove, and some of the mortar. A lot of this is is mud, basically, so it's clay with sand and straw or moss mixed in. So I could have eliminated the cement. In fact, the worst cracking spots are where I actually use the cement. So that can be eliminated completely. The windows we got from somebody online, just getting rid of them. You can always find windows cheap, either free or cheap. Could have got free ones. I'd had a whole bunch of offers for free ones after I started, after we had already bought some. But the windows were 10 bucks each, not even. If we got 14 of them for 15 or 150 dollars, or 15 of them for 140 dollars, and I'll be using those in the sauna and some of the other buildings. Um, the additional cost, though, I'm adding that, rounding that up to 30 dollars each because we had these screens made actually from a manufacturer that's in the town that's closest to here. Most expensive thing was probably other than the logs if I had it paid for them was the stove, the heating systems. The wood stove itself is really cheap. It was $160 and we bought that again used online. It was built in 1986 but it's doing a fine job for me. The more expensive part of that system was the whole chimney system. Black pipe, ceiling kit to hang it and the stainless pipe is the most expensive. Double walled six inch stainless insulated pipe that goes up through the roof and then up course higher than the peak with a, a rain cap on it so that was over 800 bucks got miscellaneous screws some stain for the counter the copper sink and copper backsplash in the kitchen and the copper behind the stove that would be over 300 dollars for that i didn't pay for it i had a thanks uh, david again for donating that copper sheet he just uh, he's a sheet metal worker in the area owns a sheet metal company and he donated this copper which was so nice of him to do. I ended up using it for several things as you can see around the cabin. So you wouldn't do that typically. You can buy it or find a, a used sink for free pretty well, pretty well or spend like 10 or 20 dollars on it. An old stainless sink. Um, some wood glue, some caulking, vapor barrier and floor insulation. I don't didn't fill much of that underneath this floor I actually put a layer of a poly vapor barrier on the ground then put bad insulation, R20 fiberglass insulation and then another layer of poly vapor barrier on top of that or on top of the joist here. So we've got a sandwich layer to keep the moisture out of it. Uh, that was to three th $350 just for that. My plan was always to do a, a sawdust insulated floor. In fact, there's a lot of things that I want to do that would have been free and more rustic. But the project was just getting out of hand as far as the labor was concerned and getting the materials, procuring materials and making materials. So I ended up going that route to get um, proper insulation. Otherwise, this floor would be really cold. Yeah, I had some propane that I used. I did a lot of the burning over an open fire to char those roof boards and these floorboards. But um, I ended up using about $100 worth of propane to char that wood. The hemlock beams, so that's something I actually did have to buy. These 6x6 these, uh, six six hemlock beams that go across the cabin, tying the walls together, stop them from moving in and out. And also, I uh, used those for the foundation. I made pine tar, I waterproofed them, and I put a little bit of roofing membrane underneath them to separate the foundation from the ground so to stop them from rotting or to slow them down at least. So um, that's the answer to all the people that are wondering why I built this right on the ground. It's actually not. The cedar logs are sitting almost, well, probably, well, a good six inches off the ground on top of those hemlock beams. And the hemlock beams, as they rot, I can just pull them out, even a section at a time or entirely. Just keep the cabin jacked up or leave enough of the rest of the thing in place. And then fill that in with, with rocks or build you know, cement uh, footings or something. So that's why I wasn't too worried about it. Got some miscellaneous 2x4s. Uh, again, all rough sun, cheap, like $1.70 each. The 2x6s were $2.40 each. The 1x10 
was two dollars and twenty cents each so all extremely cheap and that's pretty well it so basically all of the wood can be eliminated now that I have a chainsaw mill I'm actually cutting almost all of my own boards and this uh, wood that I've been cutting down other trees that I've been cutting down are now seasoned enough that I can use those for all of this year's building projects so I still have like a hundred logs or more that I can cut into lumber and that I can make uh, logs out of or walls out of. So that's why I say any of that stuff could be eliminated because essentially I did have the materials. I just uh, switched them out in order to uh, be able to do the project on the timeline that I wanted to do it on. The outhouse, I spent $181 total in materials on that for lumber. Again, just one by tens, two by sixes. It functions amazing. I have lots of uh, sawdust, cedar sawdust that we use to, to throw into the saw, um, into the outhouse. There's literally no smell in there. If there's any smell, it's almost a pleasant one of cedar shaving. So, it's uh, it's not offensive at all to use that outhouse, and it's not inconvenient even on a cold day like this. I wasn't didn't bother me to throw some boots on, warm coat, and a hat, and go out there. Yeah, so it's six thousand dollars plus whatever land. So if you can work hard or work doing what I said, like an average of $20 an hour, you're talking about 300 hours, which is, say, a 50-hour week. You're talking about six weeks you could have this all the materials procured to build a cabin like this. And, of course, if you factor in the land, if you're able to find land like this. You know, some of the other pieces of property that uh, were on the market, there was one down the road and across um, for 76,000 I think it was for 40 acres with the stream and a pond and everything on that as well. Lots of trees, thick forest. Um, I'm not sure what you can find right now. It's difficult to find an unorganized township property. Um, but depends where you are of course. But there's your range. The reason we couldn't uh, or didn't buy waterfront even in this area, the unorganized township, is that as soon as you get waterfront, the price drop, drop jumps up to two, three hundred thousand dollars for a small piece of property that's got neighbors right next to you. So you don't have the privacy and the solitude, and the wildlife, and all the stuff that we have here. So there you go. So total, if we round that up to sixty thousand dollars, I make you know, when I'm working a lot more than twenty dollars an hour. But worst case is I work a fifty-hour week for fifty weeks that's 2500 hours and uh, make say 20 bucks an hour you're talking about just over a year of actual labor of course you have a, your other things that you have to spend your money on but within a matter of two three four years if you're frugal and live somewhere cheaply that you can save up money you could be have a house like this debt free operating costs are next to nothing our property taxes are under 100 or under 300 dollars per year so again like 10 hours worth of work for somebody even doing some local handiwork around here, handyman work, and uh, no electricity costs, no water costs, food is always additional, but with all this land and all this, all the wildlife around here and the plants and the fish and water and everything, I could reduce my food costs down extremely low, and that's, I'm going to try to get it as low as I can this year and document that as well, and hopefully by this time next year I'm able to give you a, an accounting of the full years where the food costs and other expenses. I think I forgot to mention this morning what it actually cost me and how much you could actually build this cabin for if you were getting all the materials yourself from the land. So if you had access to all the trees that you need mostly. Uh, so what I ended up spending was $3,222. So $3,222. So let's say worst case that was actually $3,500. So that's what it cost me. Now, if I was so the, some of the major costs that I, I actually there's a couple of things that I could have done um, to knock prices down the cost down a little bit further. One was to keep searching or search earlier for stovepipe because often you'll see it does um, go on Kijiji or Craigslist or whatever people selling it as they remove wood stoves from their garage or from their house. So ironically, this past summer. There was some pipe for sale that was really cheap and there was enough to do the cabin and I should have picked it up at the time. It was before I decided what I was doing with the sauna. So now I'm going to be searching again for sauna uh, pipe for the stove and uh, 
I could have picked that up for next to nothing. So that was almost a thousand dollars, right? So I could could have eliminated that or reduced that down by let's say half. Yeah, so there was about twelve hundred dollars I could have eliminated in wood costs if I had of done everything with the trees that I cut down. I don't regret doing what I did because I had a timeline that I was trying to make make meet uh, trying to get the roof on before winter hit last year and I just barely made it so if I had been cutting all of my own lumber I just would not have made it but um, with a smaller cabin especially a single story cabin would have made sense to just kind of hew all the roof boards and leave them thick so essentially it would have created the structure and the substrate for nailing whatever roof material directly to it so really you could build this thing then for about two thousand dollars I would say if um, you still bought things like spikes and stuff and if you were able to get used materials I don't think you'd have any problem doing that like I said it cost me roughly let's say thirty five hundred dollars and I know I could have knocked that down another at least fifteen hundred dollars so there you go you want to build a cabin in the woods that's how cheaply you can do it okay so that was the basic uh, cost of building the cabin itself so which what I tend to call the infrastructure so getting the building up getting the outhouse built outdoor kitchen and sauna I consider part of my overall homestead um, infrastructure and the wood pile and any other projects that I have like the wood shop and things like that but those things aren't really necessary for living a wilderness home homestead life if um, you're trying to find a way or uh, figure out whether this lifestyle is as cheap as uh, you envision it to be then you would I think eliminate the the uh, luxuries and then decide whether you want to add those in over the years or not I think if um, you're the type of person who's resourceful enough to do this to begin with you're probably restless or never completely satisfied and you're going to continue to to uh, improve and develop which we tend to do and that could be what I've done but adding these more comfortable uh, buildings out buildings that are useful or continuing to improve inside uh, but anyway that what I've shown you so far is the basic cost of the building itself now one of the additional costs in this day and age is the cost of electricity and any electronics that you want to continue to operate um, when I did this the first time when I built that first cabin on a property near here 20 well 1991 so when I was 21 bought that property when I was 19 kinda used it as a as a weekend retreat uh, just sleeping in tent and stuff like that on the property and then I built that log cabin now back then there was no cell phones there was no internet so I didn't have any other costs actually once I started there uh, I had no need for electricity let's put it that way now I I do because I'm sharing all of this with you so if you want to stay connected with the world then you need to find a way to do that I'm in an area here that's not uh, extremely remote there must I don't know where the cell phone tower is but I think it's in that direction I'm on a bit of a high point here where the cabin is down in the valley and back here there's no cell phone service up on the higher ground over here there's a pretty good service and then when I get back down towards the road there isn't again um, so not completely reliable but at least I have it now I have no internet here and if I wanted that then I would need not only to install and pay for uh, satellite uh, internet and up here it's ExploreNet but also then the power to operate that or to keep that running and I don't know how much that would cost how much power that draws and whether it needs to be a consistent source or not uh, the problem with what I'm using here is electricity is sporadic because I'm generating the power with the solar panels charging the power bank and then when I don't have enough sunlight I have to fire up a generator to, to charge that power bank uh, nevertheless that's one of my issues now one of the, the other things you're going to want regardless of whether you are operating cameras and internet and stuff like that is lighting um, you can get away with just natural light well daylight and firelight that's one of the reasons we chose a wood stove with a glass 
front on it, besides the cheap cost as well, and the fact that we could cook on it. They were the main uh, drivers or the main criteria that we're looking for, a flat surface that could get hot enough to cook fully and that had glass doors to light up the cabin. Um, other than that, we used these lanterns. The lanterns are uh, they're fairly efficient. They don't burn through that much fuel, so it's fairly cheap to operate them. But again, that's something that you need to keep in mind that you have to bring in and pay for fuel to operate those lanterns. So you're in a position where if you want lighting more than candlelight, even candlelight, you need to buy candles or make candles. So there's always some cost for light. And uh, probably it's uh, the cheapest cost is actually using rechargeable lights like I am here. Headlamp for task lighting is a really good option. Um, so you don't have to have lighting throughout the cabin or throughout the outdoors. If you have a little headlamp and it operates off of one rechargeable battery that can last you a long time, years, without any additional cost, operating costs. Uh, but for me, like I said, I have, I'm filming. I've got a light on the camera right now. I have some overhead lighting. I've got this task lighting in the kitchen area, which is really helpful because the bath back side of the cabin here, being the north side, I didn't install any windows because I didn't want the cold north wind buffeting up against the cabin in the windows and and cooling down the cabin so I left it dark on this side for uh, on purpose but what that does is of course creates darkness where I want light to operate and to do things like work in the kitchen so I've gone with this goal zero system it's not the cheapest there are other other options especially if you're going to do a do-it-yourself uh, solar electricity system you can just get batteries and inverter charge controller and uh, and as many panels as you need to generate electricity. So that's going to be an initial cost, an uh, upfront capital cost. And it's going to run into the thousands. In fact, this system, solar system, is worth almost as much as the uh, whole cost of building the cabin. So you have to keep that in mind that if you're going completely or you want to go completely wilderness, uh, old uh, school, back to you know, pre-electricity days, then you can eliminate all of that cost, which is good. Because the other thing is that it also has operating costs. Batteries do run out, or batteries do die. Eventually, say six years, you need to replace them. And you may have to, um, you may have other failures in the system that you have to maintain and pay for. So that's one of the highest costs of doing this kind of lifestyle unless like I said you go more rustic which if I could do that I would do that if I was single if I was younger I would like to at least try that for a year I would have liked to have tried that for a full year living with uh, no modern conveniences just to see how well I could do as far as cleaning I get that question quite often um, both for personal hygiene as well as cleaning dishes and stuff like that. I've shown it in, a sev in several videos. These, this two piece turkey roaster. So two pieces. So you would put a turkey in typically and cook it like that. I've had that for decades. It's enamel, it uh, holds up, lasts a long time. Um, I've been using that. I started using that for carrying all my dishes for camping and then it just ended up becoming a wash basin. So fast forward many years and here I am still using it and finding it more valuable than ever. So I have one hanging here, one hanging by the fire. Um, I often have, if I have room on the stove, I've often got a pot of, or this one of these filled with water um, just simmering away on the stove. It's uh, helping for uh, humidity, adding humidity into the air because the wood stove radiant heat can get quite dry and also of course then it's available all the time for washing. So I find that extremely helpful or very uh, simple, easy and efficient. Now the same thing applies to personal hygiene. I think we're spoiled, and I have been too, spoiled to have uh, running water and hot water on demand. Um, and a shower is nice, but it's not necessary. So what I found is this sink that I made out of copper is nice and deep. 
and in fact it's so deep that I don't like filling it. I wouldn't fill it. I don't think I've ever fully filled it. Instead, I do use those a lot of times for washing dishes right in there. I'll just rest it here, take the dishes and let them dry in the sink. Um, sometimes I will put water in the sink and, and do that. But what I find it the most useful for is doing something like washing hair, kind of sponge bathing here. Um, and that's the other, that's the answer to the shower question. So, nothing wrong with sponge bath bathing. So I get hot water on the stove. I can either uh, stand in front of the stove right there, which I often do. Um, I have that big brass pot in the winter last year and in the summer, or mostly in the winter and spring, I guess. I would just stand in that and, and sponge bathe in front of the wood stove. And then, of course, once summer rolls around, a nice hard rain, go out there and stand and with a bar of soap or shampoo or something and wash off do, doing that. Uh, jump in the lake. You've seen me bathe down on the creek here behind the cabin when the water's flowing and it's clean, clear. Um, all this rainwater that I'm collecting off the roof now, that's uh, easy to wash with. So there's a lot of ways to wash. It's, it's not uh, a, as big an issue once you start doing it as you think it is. And you get used to the cold water and it's nice. Now, that being said, that's easy for me. I, I don't mind that and I've always done that. But as far as my wife is concerned, and even for myself now, I'm starting to get spoiled. This idea of the sauna bathhouse is uh, kind of exciting because we'll not only have a hot sauna, but hot water in there as well coming off the wood stove that we can use to pump into it through a shower head or just dump a bucket of hot water over, over you. It's a lot easier to wash your hair and just uh, get rejuvenated, I guess, with a nice hot shower and, and sauna. So we are looking forward to that. Now another fairly significant challenge is food and how do you um, store food and preserve it. Uh, so this solar system, electricity system, has allowed us to add this little fridge. The little fridge is handy for smaller items and there's a small freezer at the top to freeze some stuff. Uh, what I'm finding um, it most efficient most useful for is to anything that needs to be frozen like meat or kept frozen, put it in that little freezer in the top and put some ice in there with it and then I can turn the fridge off so it barely draws any power. That's also the coldest spot in the cabin being the furthest from the fire up against a, an outside wall. So it tends to not actually come on that often. Um, for the same reason, I've got the ice box thing in the floor here, the food storage thing in the floor. Uh, that's far from the stove, it's low north side. That's also very cold all the time, even in the summer. Um, tip, little tip I picked up on, I think it was a Netflix program on an off-grid house, I think in Colorado or something. So vinegar would come in these, oil, a like cooking oil, uh, windshield washer fluid and stuff like that. But if, you, if it is windshield washer fluid, just make sure you never drink out of this container. In fact, we don't use this for drinking water at all. Just continue to freeze it. So in the summer, I can put one of these cracked open so that it doesn't expand like this one did. Cracked open, put it in the freezer of that fridge, turn on the fridge for a day. Uh, freeze these, then turn the fridge off and let these keep everything cold. And if you pack uh, food tight, like a bunch of meat for example, and one of these tight in a freezer, just fill that space up and try to keep it filled with frozen items all the time, you'd be surprised how long it lasts. Um, in the winter, of course, I just put these outside, let them freeze, bring them in, drop them down into the ice box in the floor to keep the temperature a little bit more stable, cold and stable. And same thing with the fridge, that so can go in the fridge with one of these can go in the fridge with the uh, refrigerated items to keep food fresh. So that pretty well eliminates um, or substantially reduces the cost of refrigeration. My long-term goal is to have a whole bunch of these containers, say 50 of them or more, uh, freeze those in the winter and then store them underground covered in sawdust in a fully insulated cellar that will keep that ice from melting all summer long. Of course that's not a new technique and it's not um, trial and error, that's something that's been done throughout history. You know, ice boxes were common up until not that long ago. So that cellar that I need to get built underground is going to have to have good drainage in case of melt, meltage and also big enough that I can store 
a lot of ice, not only of these containers, but also that I can cut from the lake, big huge chunks that will cut directly from the lake. That'll get stored in sawdust, so I need room to have all that sawdust to cover it. And then probably put straw bales on top of the building and then around the sides, but most of it's gonna be underground. So that's the solution and it's a way that if you were starting, uh, planning on building a place like this in the wilderness or semi-wilderness, then just digging it into the north side of a hill where the sun never hits it in the summer is going to provide pretty good refrigeration food storage. Now, if, if you've seen the north sides of, of uh, cliffs, so on the south side of a lake, if there's a high cliff and all the ice and everything and snow that accumulates over the winter gets uh, dense enough, deep enough, you'll find that um, even in late May, the sun doesn't hit that and there'll still be ice on that, on that, uh, the north side of that cliff in the middle of, uh, sometimes into June even. So the, same so the same principle applies. So I have a good north slope here right behind the cabin so the cellar is going to go down in there. So if you've been following along, watching my videos throughout the process for the last year and a half, seeing me building stuff, you'll see a lot of materials come here from, from here on the land, including everything from this staircase. So handrail is a piece of um, hard maple, it's a sugar maple. The stringers and the treads are an ash from a, an ash tree that had died actually from the emerald ash borer probably two years ago, but it was still standing dry and sound, so not rotted at all yet. Uh, a dowel, made hardwood dowels out of ash, maple and birch. Now to go in through the sides to support these treads as well. And through the sides here, what I didn't show is that I've got pins going in through the sides here, just smaller dowels and in some cases screws. So essentially very close to free to build this staircase. So that's what a lot of the stuff in here is essentially free. Um, just as long as you have access to, to wood trees, uh, forests like this. So to continue developing and adding things to the property like uh, even furniture inside and out and things like that the more time you have on your hands uh, of course you have time to make things like that and you have time for projects that are useful and and uh, entertaining so a couple of luxury items like this camp mattress that we had made by a company that manufactures mattresses for for well a number of things but they make camp mattresses so the kids camps uh, it's foam, four inches thick, and it's covered in a vinyl that um, you can easily wipe clean. Of course, that's helpful in a camp where you've got kids making a mess and uh, mice and stuff like that. So that's why we did it for, we figured there would be more mice in here and that would be easier to clean this up and take the uh, linens off and just wash those separately. And of course, pillows and stuff like that are little bit of luxury as well. Now this area here gets used um, mainly for of course eating at the table but the reason this bench is so wide it's uh, three three feet wide or 30 inches wide. The reason for that is that this doubles as a single bed and in the summer I found last summer I found that I actually slept on this quite often because it got warm up in the loft. Uh, Callie is also now claim this partially as her bed, but if any guests stay over, that's where they would stay. Now up in the loft, we have a double mattress, same specification, so four inches thick and well, six feet long, and then whatever the width is of a double mattress. And it's quite comfortable, actually. And we've got comforter and blankets and stuff like that up there. The furs, what I originally always wanted to do was have just more furs, and that would be the bedding. That's still the plan. I just have to continue to harvest enough animals and preserve the hides in order to do that. So again, wilderness living um, can be done without hunting and fishing, I suppose, if you are able to provision yourself quite often. So have somebody bring in stuff to you or you're able to get out uh, easily to some kind of civilization to get it. I'm only about half an hour from this uh, nearest village here so that I can provision and then about an hour to a bigger town so that we can get food there as well. 
So at this stage, I'm still doing that. Now, of course, I haven't had time to stock up food here. I don't have a garden yet. Um, this is my first year hunting this property, really. Just did a little bit of small game hunting here last year. So I'm still learning the lay of the land, still learning the wildlife uh, habits and their ranges and everything. So next year it'll be a lot more, it'll be a lot more self-sufficient from the actual land. So in the meantime, I have to provision in town once every week or two. And of course, I have to upload videos as well because I don't have internet here. Now, I typically go into town to do everything at once. So I'll check the uh, mailbox, I'll uh, buy groceries, any supplies that I need, like building materials or fuel or whatever else I need. And then, of course, um, uploading the videos. I'll try to have enough ready to go, like a week or a week and a half's worth of videos so that I can upload all of those at once. Now, of course, my family's not here with me full-time so that's my opportunity to spend time with them. My daughters are in uh, post-secondary education so they're off to school but my wife um, when she's not up here with me then I go and visit with her of course down in the in the village. Uh, so the furs that I'm using here I've got caribou uh, hides hanging on the windows. I'll put those on the wall here when they're not on the windows. That's primarily couple things. One's for privacy when I'm not here in case somebody was to come onto the property. Uh, I have those hanging on the in, inside like curtains. But the primary reason is to uh, prevent the, or just to help with insulation. Windows are the least efficient part of a any kind of home, including a log cabin. No R value in them. The heat passes right through and the cold comes in. So the fur on the windows helps with that. So I'll generally just put those up at night when, of course, there's no daylight to help provide lighting inside the cabin. If it's dark outside, I may as well put those on and retain heat. So the fur that I uh, can collect around here would include moose, uh, rabbit, I've got a couple of rabbit hides here. I've got some white-tailed deer hides, uh, furs that I've um, collected over the years, and I'll continue to do that so from now on. I usually donate my hides to the First Nations program, and um, so the First Nations make uh, things out of the furs or use the furs for their own use. Uh, instead of donating those for the next few years, at least I'll start keeping hides here. Uh, bear, deer, moose, uh, rabbit, and maybe some raccoons and stuff like that. Whatever's on the property that, um, and everything's harvested for food, not just for furs. Um, then once I get enough, then I'll go back to probably donating them to the First Nations. So one of the other major costs, of course, is keeping warm. And in this climate up here, it's uh, you got a long heating season. So essentially, typically first frost is the first week, uh, let's say on average of October. And then the last frost is around the third week of May. So you have, may as well say, all of October, November, December, January, February, March, April, and part of May. So really June, July, August, September-ish is about your heat, uh, season where you don't even want to have a fire inside pretty much ever. Because it's nice to have a cool space that you never heat up. Now this last year I noticed that there was times that if it was really damp out and there was um, a lot of humidity that it got damp in here. So I think what I'll do next summer is to light up a... Uh, uh, Pretty hot fire, maybe once every two or three weeks or something like that, just to dry the place out. And sometime, you know, when I'm not needing to come inside at all, or I know it's going to be a cool night or something like that, I can do that. But the point being that heating is going to be a major continuous cost. And I'm fortunate that I have 20 acres here, and I also have permission from other people around here to collect firewood. I have about a year and a half of supply right now. I've already identified trees and source for other firewood that would last me, well, let's say I've got six, seven, eight bush cords, something like that, and I don't think I'll go through three bush cords this year. So that comes at some kind of cost, either an energy cost, a fuel cost for a chainsaw, because I'm just not at that stage yet myself that I can cut enough firewood by hand with a handsaw to uh, provide enough firewood. So I'm still using a chainsaw. Probably after next year, I'll try to eliminate a chainsaw as much as possible 
and just use a handsaw because I'll have more time on my hands. So the cost of firewood, if you can't buy it locally, or you can't um, source it, enough of it on your own land or from anywhere you have permission to do so, then the option is to get a full load of logs in, um, a full load of, of firewood logs up here is anywhere, I don't know how much it is, I heard this year it's going to be like closer to $1,500 and from that you should get around six to seven bush cords. I think last year it was $1,000 for a full truckload. Um, so like I said, that's uh, let's say you go through three, let's say that truckload lasts you two years, you're talking about uh, 500 bucks for for a heating season per year, plus your fuel, plus your uh, gas for your chainsaws, so maybe another hundred bucks, or shouldn't be well, it wouldn't be more than a hundred dollars for oil and gas. But that's a cost, right? So you have to factor that in as well. Now, if you can cut everything by hand, you can eliminate that cost all the way down to zero. If you're living fully in the wilderness and don't need to work and don't have to spend time building places like I've been building. So while we're on the subject of fire and heat. Um, I would say that probably right near the very top of uh, wilderness skills that you need to do this kind of thing would be starting a fire in any conditions and as nice as it feels to start a fire with a bow drill or a hand drill or um, striker or a flint and steel or even a ferro rod all of those things take a lot of practice and a lot of energy actually even when you are well practiced at it and you're efficient at it some of those things are very tiring like the bow drill and the hand drill are very very tiring and it can be very frustrating even with a, a ferro rod a fire steel to get a fire started so yes you should know how to do those things but in this day and age cheap pick lighter in your pocket at all times in fact i have these things planted everywhere and all of my gear every pack that i own including my camera case, uh, pockets all over, my uh, bottom pockets like in my pants, in jackets and stuff, I've always got lighters and some of them are always at least one is in a plastic bag, like a Ziploc bag that's waterproof and that's in my pocket or close to my body to keep it warm. In the winter these uh, lighters do freeze up and you won't be able to operate it so by having it in my pocket it's always going to light. And when you're cold, and you're really cold, maybe even an emergency situation, you can't be trying to rely on your primitive fire making skills because you may not make it. You may not get a fire going before hypothermia sets into the point where you can't even function enough to build a fire. So that's the other thing about fire is your hands are way more valuable than I think you give them credit for in that kind of situation. You assume that you're going to have the dexterity if you say fall through the ice when you're ice fishing, like my, I'll be at, at risk coming up, especially in the earlier part of the season. Um, if that was to happen, you're going to be very, very cold very quickly, and you're going to lose not only mental capacity, but also function in your hands. And your, your dexterity is going to be so poor that even operating a lighter is going to be difficult. So lighters, in addition to other primitive uh, fire making methods like a ferro rod or a flint and steel I'd recommend before relying on a bow drill. Um, keep a, uh, some watertight matches as well. Keep some watertight big lighters. If you can as well then have some other kind of uh, fire tinder or a spark a holder. A birch bark is good of course shredded in your pocket or in a bag ideally. Uh, Vaseline soaked cotton balls are, are efficient, wax impregnated things, fat wood which is resinous wood from a pine tree typically, uh, red pine in particular, we have a lot of that here. So to have the candle, that's another good thing to have in your kit, several of them if you can. Uh, little esbit fuel tabs, so many uh, fire uh, things that make uh, lighting a fire and, and maintaining a fire easier that it's foolish not to have that on you. It's not a game when you're in a survival situation. It's serious and you need to be able to get a fire going quickly and big fire typically. A drying fire needs to be a big mound of whatever. So the other thing then about your hands is to have some way of warming your hands up. I always have a down jacket or vest like this. 
bound up tight in a, in a dry bag on me as well as in a kit. So I'll typically have two of them. And I would suggest either a big fur muffs or big mitts, not gloves. So I would always have something like this when you're traveling in the wilderness. Something that you can get your hands in that's really, really warm. Your fingers are together, they're not separated in a glove. Or even, like I said, just a tube or something that you can put your hands in to warm yourself up. And ideally, if you could also get that close to your body to warm your hands up, you're going to need to continue to do that if you ever need that in a wilderness situation. So that's just a quick thing that you need to keep in mind that if you're doing all of this, those are small costs, but your skill is going to be the number one thing that you need to, uh, to do this kind of thing, to live this kind of lifestyle. So of course you're going to need tools to build this place, but also to live that wilderness lifestyle as well. So again, a bit of a cost associated with that. A good axe, mandatory of course, if you can afford it or if you have room and resources, then you know more than one axe is nice to have. I've got splitting axe, I've got, I've got different building axes, but let's say for everyday use, continuing to just live in the wilderness, you're Ideally, you'd want like a camp axe like this, which is essentially a slightly uh, bigger hatchet, but a hatchet would be fine as well. And then a bigger axe for cutting trees down and for splitting and stuff like that, which you've seen me use lots. I've got some outside. If you're living, again, a wilderness lifestyle and you're trying to collect food cheaply, living off the land up here is impossible. I, I mean, I don't think it's even debatable. I don't know if there's anybody who would even try to suggest that you can live off the land as a vegetarian here in Canada. I mean, look at it outside. It's November. Haven't seen the ground for a month. Bare ground. And therefore, no fruits and vegetables, that's for sure. Anything that I was able to collect earlier wasn't able to get in large enough quantities other than maple syrup to live off of. So living here means uh, harvesting fish and game. I have several uh, different firearms and methods of um, that I hunt with, uh, including archery primarily actually for big game and then for for a big game with more assurance I have my rifle, 30-06 rifle and shotgun. Shotgun is you basically could shoot everything with a shotgun. If I was to have like, just one firearm and something I knew that I could harvest anything with, it would be a 12 gauge shotgun. This is an old side by side that my dad gave me. I think he got it in like 1971. It's cheap, it's, it's an Ithaca um, model 1100 or something like that, or 100, I guess it is. Uh, side by side, there's nothing to go wrong with that. It just hinges open and you feed a couple of shells into it. I can harvest anything from rabbits, squirrels, grouse ducks all the way up to a shot bear, deer, never shot a moose with a shotgun but it's possible so that's a very good all-around gun if you can only afford one gun or only want to have one or only have the, the uh, time and space for one then uh, 12 gauge is what I would recommend. 30-06 for me is the ideal rifle because I can again I can shoot caribou I have shot caribou, moose, bear and deer with that that rifle and it can easily handle any big game. There's lots of arguments about different calibers, but I find for me, after doing all the research years ago, that's what I found to be the most efficient gun for me because I'm not a gun collector. I just want whatever tools I need to do the job as cheaply and efficiently as possible. And speaking of archery, I've been making my own arrows for years. Some of these arrows are probably 15, 20 years old. Um, I'm going to get back into making them again and making more right from scratch like I used to do so that all that dead ash that I made this out of nice straight grain some of it and some of it's pretty tight so slow growing very very strong dense it's a heavy arrow so you have to have a bow strong enough to shoot that but it's a very efficient um, weight for the arrows are a very efficient weight for harvesting a big game. So I'll be making those again probably next summer will be one of the projects that I work on is doing a whole bunch. Then I fletch them with 
uh, turkey feathers. I don't know if I have any in here. Yeah, there's one. In fact, there's an arrow that I made years ago. So that's uh, feathers from a turkey that I harvested, wing feathers. It's a self knock, so I just cut the knock in to the end of the arrow. Um, I need to wrap these. Typically what I do is I'll wrap that with sinew from the animal so that that doesn't split because once the arrow is released when you pull back, the string can puts a lot of transfers a lot of energy to the arrow and because it is straight grain it'll actually split the arrow so you have to wrap that. I made that dowel with a little doweling jig that I made. So free arrow is well not essentially that is a free arrow except for the tip I ended up buying a traditional uh, steel tips for these and those will last forever if you take care of them and they're very efficient as well. So again, another way of cutting costs. I can harvest small game and big game for essentially free, except for the cost of the tag. So here, it's uh, I don't know how much it is anymore because I usually buy my license three years at a time. General hunting license costs you thirty dollars a year, which um, allows you to hunt small game, and then on top of that, you'll have your big game tags that are around forty dollars for deer, bear, moose, and things like that. So you can probably for let's say two hundred dollars have enough and waterfowl is another tag you need for migratory game birds so let's say two hundred dollars a year would give you all the tags you need to harvest enough meat to provide for at least you and another person and if that other person got tags as well and the game was available then you could live pretty well for uh, uh, say four hundred dollars a year as far as meat's concerned now fish is another thing entirely. Uh, fishing licenses are fairly cheap. I think $25 let's say a year here. And we have over 250,000 lakes in Ontario so there's always something to fish for. There's always some season that's open and there's always species that are abundant in almost every lake and river that maybe aren't sport species but they still taste good and they still provide lots of protein and fat in some cases. So catfish, good example, um, suckers, uh, panfish like uh, sunfish and stuff like that. Long seasons, uh, um, generous um, uh, limits so you can harvest and possess. You have to check the fishing game um, regulations every year to make sure there's no changes. Get to know the fishing game regulations for the area that you're in and then try to take advantage of those underutilized species instead of targeting the bigger more popular species that end up becoming um, you know, scarce or underpopulated because the har they're harvested at too high a rate. So the nice thing about Ontario we have so many lakes and rivers that you can always find some lake that hardly ever gets fished especially if, if you have a way to get back to it like um, canoeing, taking a lightweight canoe that you can carry far into the bush through Cross portages, down rivers, cr down across lakes, get in far, far away from civilization and from roads. And then in the winter, same thing applies for the snowmobile, which is one of the things I did this year. Finally bought a snowmobile so that I can access all those backcountry lakes. And that's what I'll be doing a lot of this year in order to ultimately, it does uh, cut down my uh, cost for fuel for wood. But also, of course, the fish uh, cost of fish. Fish is very expensive. So if I can harvest enough uh, fish and game and firewood with the snow machine, then it'll pay for the cost, initial cost of that thing, as well as the maintenance and fuel for it, which is a trade-off, right? If I was living in an area that was very rich with fish and game, and I was living alone, I could probably get enough food right from the immediate area. But... Um, I'm in central Ontario, it's not far, far north wilderness and it's not south where there's a lot of plants to eat as well. So I do need to be, get out beyond what I can walk, especially in the winter here in order to harvest fishing game. So there's another additional cost. It's the capital cost of buying a snow machine in this case and then cost of maintenance and fuel and ability to get that fuel. So you have to be again provisioning ends up being a major cost and a major um, consideration for 
uh, location where you choose to be. You know, in somebody like Dick Prennicke's case, he ended up getting having somebody who could fly his provisions in every week. Sometimes, quite often, sometimes he would have planes coming in every day or two or three for different reasons, but he was able to capitalize on that. Um, very few people that can live without provisioning. And depending on your location, that may just mean that if you're in a more inaccessible place that you have to stockpile, you have to stock, uh, create inventory of all the things you need from maintenance items to food to fuel. Yeah, maybe you can't get out or maybe you don't see anybody for six months, depending on where you are. You just need to have a plan in place for that. When I first moved out of the city, and we moved to our first house, my wife and I, in a, in the country, we were, how were we, uh, 40 minutes or so, 30, 35 minutes from the nearest town, and we just had to get used to not um, leaving our vehicles empty of fuel, for example. When you're in town, you fill up, and you don't ever have a almost empty vehicle in the driveway. Yet when you go grocery shopping, you buy enough to last at least a week, and you always have enough other food on hand that if you couldn't get in for reasons like snow, which we often get snowed in up here, that um, you have enough food on hand that it's not a big deal. And a way to cook it. If you have no electricity, then if you have a wood stove, propane, a cook camp stove or something like that, some method to cook your food and provide some heat if you have no electricity. Uh, last week there was no electricity here for I think three days in a lot of places I heard. Um, Especially in the village close to here, I think they were, yeah, I think they were out for two or three days, and you have to be prepared for that at all times. I think uh, this may be one of the bigger questions that, or more frequent questions I get, and the biggest concern that a lot of people have is using the outhouse. Anywhere from people asking why I didn't put uh, bathroom facilities inside the cabin to, you know, why didn't I at least attach it to the side of the cabin or put it closer. And of course, the main reason for that is odor. I don't, I don't want to, um, I don't want to have the outhouse, the bathroom, that is not flushable. You know, flush your waste away here. I don't want that in my living quarters. So this distance, about what are we? 15 yards, maybe 50 feet, I would say, from the cabin is this outhouse, and. It, I dug a hole uh, about four feet deep and built this outhouse over top of it. Now, I haven't found this to be an issue at all and actually neither has my wife using an out outhouse. When you're inside the cabin, you put a warm coat on and a hat at this time of year and you walk out, you do your business and you walk and then you go back in the cabin and you appreciate the heat that much more. I haven't found it, um, like I said, too cold. In the summer, doesn't seem to be any insects that come in here. I was concerned about the spaces, like a big ventilation window I have above the door here. And I hadn't, haven't put battens on the outside yet. So there's lots of air gaps. Bugs don't go in there. You're not in there long enough to attract them. And it's ventilated well enough that the odor doesn't accumulate. Now the other thing we do for controlling odor is in the side compartment here. That's where all the ash from the wood stove goes, the charcoal and the uh, sawdust, especially cedar sawdust. You know, these two boxes on either side of the, the throne are full of sawdust. So when you're done your business, you scoop some of that sawdust or ash or a combination of the two, you dump it down there and there's no odor in here. In fact, it's actually a pleasant odor, which is the first outhouse I can say that I'm um, not offended by. So, not bad at all. Like I said, even my wife doesn't have a problem with this, summer or winter. And with privacy not being an issue too, uh, the door stays open most of the time when it's being used and it's not a bad view of the cabin. So as far as the sauna is concerned, the bathhouse, that's immediately behind me here. And that's only about 20 feet from the outhouse here. So maybe 70 feet from the cabin. So that's not a long distance. And if, you're, if you've used a traditional sauna outside, like in a separate building like this, then you know that you get so hot in those things that 
coming out to the cold is actually refreshing. In fact, that's typically what you do. You jump in the sauna for 20 minutes, 10 to 20 minutes, come out, roll in the snow or stand in the snow or jump in a lake even, and then go back in the sauna to warm up again and just do that cycle. It's actually very healthy for you. It's a heart uh, strengthener and uh, there's other benefits as well. But that's the method of hygiene that we will be using here. Uh, the bathhouse will have a shower. Um, there's a hot tank on the back of the wood stove inside the sauna for scooping water out of or pumping it through a shower head. And then there'll be a little change room in there as well. And it's big enough that it might come up with some other purpose. And then it'll also have a sink for brushing teeth and shaving and stuff. So fully functional bathhouse. They're separate. Now, some people would think it's inconvenient having to go from the cabin to the outhouse to the bathhouse or straight to the bathhouse if you're just having a sauna or a shower. But again, it's just what you're used to. Once you get used to this, it's not inconvenient at all. And it's actually, uh, I don't know, something about living like this that I find, I don't know, I just like it. I, I think uh, living a more simple, rustic lifestyle is, is, um, you're just more in tune with everything, I guess. The temperature matters, the season matters, the bugs matter, all of these things matter and you pay more attention to them. So your mind is working and you're, you're um, in, being more innovative and, and I think more just in tune with yourself and in tune with nature. And I think that's a good thing. Now the outdoor kitchen, there's the cabin, there's the outdoor kitchen, there's the wood pile. So again, the outdoor kitchen is maybe 15, 20 feet from the uh, cabin. Not in inconvenient at all. I wanted the cabin to be visible on its own without having to look at, it, especially like photograph or film, and get both of those in the same thing. So I offset the kitchen far enough away and off to one side so that I could still see the cabin clearly on its own. And it's close enough that any fire hazard there is li not likely to, to become a hazard to that cabin itself to the main cabin so in there I've got the oven and the grill and the little uh, rocket stove of course so that's summer uh, cooking not using it this time of year except for uh, grilling the odd thing uh, firewood pile wood shed over here is there for a reason people ask me why I put it so far from the cabin well first of all I don't get any firewood from this direction behind the cabin it drops into a valley there it's softwood it's a creek it's buggy in the buggier in the winter or in the summer and then it's crown land public land beyond that so i don't actually i hunt over there but i don't get firewood from over there all my firewood comes from this direction this is where the majority of the property is where all the hardwood is um, down the driveway and out to the road when i bring in firewood from there um, again all in that direction so i have to pass this woodshed every time i bring firewood in or cut firewood so it's not like I have to I'm passing the cabin to bring my firewood further away and then have to bring it back again so that's number one for efficiency the second thing is that it creates a mess splitting firewood and cutting firewood so I want the mess further away from the cabin accumulating there and also there's a fire pit right there so I can burn scraps and wood chips and all that kind of stuff and sit around a campfire over there away from the cabin again no fire hazard to the cabin or the kitchen and it's kind of just a little uh, get together spot to uh, just enjoy a campfire away from the, the main cabin a little bit so all the wood like i said ends up getting split cut stacked over there kindling i cut up um, any woodworking projects that's making a lot of sawdust and wood chips and stuff i do all of that over there so the wood pile or woodshed cost me about uh, $80 for all the wood on top of that and for the roofing tar or tar paper, roofing tar paper. And uh, I'll put another layer of wood on that in the spring. Uh, posts were all just cut from the property or cut from my friend's property. So no cost for those. And it holds about a bush cord and a half of firewood. Or about two bush cords, I guess, of firewood. So. I'm starting to take enough out of there I need to start replenishing it so I'll go and bring some more up in the next few days um, but that's fairly essential 
to have a covered area for your firewood you can bring it in if it gets wet like I did last year or just tarp it over as well to reduce cost or if you don't have time to build a shed like I didn't then uh, keep it um, under tarp under the eaves of the cabin and then bring it in a day at least before you're going to use it so it can dry inside the cabin so the outdoor kitchen here I think it was more of a luxury uh, what I ended up doing first of all I really wanted an earthen oven um, mainly for cooking bread rather than pizza so baking sourdough bread and then any big uh, joints of meat like a turkey I'm probably gonna cook a turkey in there before Christmas in the next week or two and uh, nice to have that well when you do an oven out of earth out of mud you need to keep it dry otherwise it's just mud right it just washes away eventually so I had to cover that with a roof I covered it with that roof built this pavilion and built it big enough that it, I could put the barbecue under there and it was high enough that sparks weren't gonna uh, catch the roof on fire and all the countertops kind of became pretty big got wine barrels for collecting water and all that kind of stuff so the cost of that ended up getting uh, quite high and I didn't mind that just because it is so functional um, it's being basically a pavilion that I can do other stuff under to, to keep me dry and also of course the cooking so the cost there was cement and the cedar shingles which were several hundred dollars which I would started making them on my own but it was just too much work and uh, time mostly time to to make those all by hand so again a lot of these things aren't necessary in order to start so it's things that you would add over time if you feel inclined or if you have enough money to do that not necessary to have them so i don't consider the, this outdoor kitchen a cost of setting up a wilderness retreat that uh, is essential i would call the outhouse pretty much an essential although when i first built it it was just a thunder box that was uncovered which was next to nothing and you can just build that out of, out of pieces of wood if you want build a, a dig a hole in the ground and away you go but you know, for a little bit more comfort I would call say the cabin and the outhouse are your essential buildings so that's basically it that's the tour of the property tour of the the uh, cabin the home, little homestead area at least here and the cost so like I said about six thousand dollars for somebody to build this cabin exactly paying for all of the materials less than two thousand if you can cut all the wood from the property or for, from somebody else's property uh, ongoing costs are going to be food which is just I mean that's a given no matter where you are um, you'll be able to reduce your food costs substantially and man you get it down to you wouldn't spend more than a few dollars a day if you do it uh, right by buying things like rice and potatoes and vegetables in bulk or growing as much of those things as you can buying grain in bulk that stores well like a uh, whole grain whole uh, wheat uh, kernels for example uh, wheat berries that you grind as you use it for flour so that it doesn't go bad you can buy huge quantities of that for next to nothing so if you can get your food cost down to say three dollars a day per person by harvesting fish and game growing as much as you can so I don't want to get in I don't want to become a full-time gardener again I've done that in the past and I found that it consumes all of my time and then I don't have time for other things that I want to do like exploring hunting fishing and uh, you know just getting food wild foods if I spend too much time maintaining uh, garden vegetable gardens and raising chickens and everything like that I just can't leave and do what I want to do I can't go on long canoe trips or fishing trips or hunting trips or snowshoeing trips or visiting my family whatever um, I know lots of people that have done the, that kind of homestead and are still doing it I've done it in the past and I found that for me it just wasn't for me yes it saved um, money in some cases in a lot of cases it didn't I found that you know, I hate to encourage or or suggest that uh, you can't live fully self-sufficiently and therefore use the system and pay people to, who are specialized to provide things for you like food. But the reality is I've grown grain on a rented farm, a farm that we rented, leased for free essentially. 
um, eight acres that I planted buckwheat and and wheat and uh, rye and a couple other things I forget what else barley and and it's a lot of work and you have to stick with it you have to do predator control and pest control and weeding all of that stuff I've raised chickens at the same time and beef and pigs and it's a full-time job and, and it should be it, it you should be passionate about that if that's what you're uh, that's what you want to do and if you want to feel feel that self-sufficient that you've provided all your own food it's very rewarding but it's a lot of work and it typically it's a bit of a, a prison cell and that you can't get out and do anything else and again if you like doing that if that's what you what, what you're passionate about and you love spending time and I do to up to a certain degree but I just don't feel like for me that being tied down to a farm is the right lifestyle for me and good for you if you do that um, I'm sure you love it and I'm sure it's um, very fulfilling and you have a meaningful life it just isn't for me so here at the property I probably will not get too intensive with my gardening I love the permaculture a philosophy and forest gardening and those that will be what I'll be doing mainly here planting stuff throughout the forest things that aren't invasive non-native and, and invasive that that uh, start replacing the flora and fauna that's already here so I'll, I'll be responsible about it but that's the plan to encourage the things that already grow here the mushrooms the the berries the um, you know cattails and all the teas and f other funguses and stuff like that there's lots of that kind of stuff but uh, and there's lots of fish and game so I'm not going to raise chickens here when I can shoot waterfowl and, and grouse and I'm not going to raise beef when I can harvest deer and moose I guess that's the bottom line so and that's like, my way of keeping my costs down and allows me to focus on the things that um, I'm more passionate about or more interested in and also that uh, do reduce the cost because um, I'm better at that than I am at farming. Now there will be other costs like transportation costs to go into town to uh, provision food, uh, su other supplies, um, uploading videos, collecting mail, stuff like that. It's starting to freeze a little bit. It's cold out here with this wind chill. Um, uh, what else will be a food cost because I am buying stuff of course. I'm not done construction so I'll have additional construction costs this year and uh, that's the majority have some insurance costs on the machine now there's no insurance on this place my property taxes are less than three hundred dollars per year because it's unorganized township there's no hydro costs now that I have solar I have no water costs I have no sewage costs so trying to think if there's anything else I'm going to spend this year coming up 2019 accounting for everything so I'll be tracking my food costs every week I'll be tracking my transportation costs be tr tracking my fuel costs for chainsaw and snow machine um, license fees for hunting and fishing the uh, cost of equipment for that type of thing for my outdoor recreation uh, any wood costs if I have any um, what else candles and stuff like that fuel I guess for the lanterns and things like that I'll account for everything in 2019 and continue to share that to you, with you regularly and then do a summary video at the end of the year so you get a handle on or a feel for what it truly costs to do this kind of thing I think what I've provided in this video or what I've summarized it's been helpful for me I hope it's been helpful uh, for you as well it's been uh, something I've been curious about actually for quite a while is what this actually cost me and what it's going to continue to cost me and what it um, what it could have cost me if I had been more proficient efficient or uh, less concerned about actually documenting the whole process so hope you found it interesting as well if you have any questions please please comment below I think this is going to be maybe an interesting conversation for all of us to have I'd like to hear your suggestions for reducing costs further or what you think you would like to see added here and what the cost of that would be, what um, people consider sort of a bare minimum for living, uh, standard of living, and whether this is an attractive lifestyle to you or something that you'd like to try at least. I think for me, 
I think it's something that I th would be amazing if everybody could try this for a year. I think, uh, of course, we couldn't have everybody try it. There's not enough resources. But if you have an opportunity to either live somewhere where it's similar to this that somebody else has already built and and uh, all the infrastructures and places, no additional resources being consumed, to live simply for a year and see how you like that, uh, how rewarding it is, but also to put the rest of your life in perspective. I can tell you when I go into town and flip on a light switch or have a shower or something like that, um, there's an appreciation for that, but also an appreciation for how much, what that cost is for the society to provide that and the uh, number of people it takes to maintain that, those systems. So I do appreciate it, yet it makes me appreciate this even more. So I think it's a, a great experiment for everybody to undergo or try out sometime in their life and, and then uh, kind of apply the principles of this simpler lifestyle to the modern lifestyle. Give you a better appreciation for frugality and for, for water, electricity and food and what luxuries are, you know, not um, as rewarding as the actual cost of them are. So, interesting to me and I'm having a great time doing this. I'm learning a lot and I plan to learn a lot more or hope I'll learn a lot more over the next few years and that you know, if this um, continues, I'm able to continue and to grow this lifestyle even more, make it, you know, 100% of my life with my family, then that would be amazing. And if not, then uh, what have I learned from it? Well, I was able to do it. So I appreciate you guys following along. I hope you're learning from something from the channel as I am from what I'm doing here and that uh, you're inspired to go out and do something interesting each and every day of your life, regardless of what it is. So that when you look back and and uh, you reflect on your life that you don't have any regrets. So thanks for watching this again. I really appreciate it and I look forward to seeing you up at the cabin next time. Take care.